Hey guys, it's Pastor Rocco, and we're welcoming you back to another exciting week of our New Life Oneana Upstreet Kids video Bible lesson. We hope you had a happy Thanksgiving this past Thursday, and we're really excited for our fourth and final week of our stand theme, Don't Face Your Fears Alone, where all month long we've been talking about our big important word of the month, which is courage. And courage is knowing what you should do, even when you're afraid. And we've got some great stories this month about people who stood and had courage because God stood by their side. We learned about Daniel. We learned about David. And this week's story, we're going to learn about Esther. And it's a great story that continues to show us this theme of courage throughout the Bible. This week's message is all about doing what you should, even when you're afraid, because you don't know what the outcome is going to be yet. Guys, we have a great lesson for you this week. We can't wait to kick it off. We're going to start out with a little bit of worship music, and then we're going to dive right into the lesson. So, here we go. When I wake up, when I wake up, I know that you are with me every step of the way. You're strong enough. You're strong enough to handle any fear that I face Even things that scare me, cause they seem too big Even all the hard things that make me wanna quit You're bigger than it all, and you're in charge of it I don't feel so worried when I look to you, Jesus Welcome to Story Lab. This week, we're talking about courage. While we take a look at the story of a girl who stood up for an entire nation. Oh, and we're also going here. Hey, I'm Skylar. And I'm Sebastian. We're talking about courage. That's being brave enough to do what you should do, even when you're afraid. We all have to be brave sometimes, but some people have to be brave every day for their job. People like bomb diffusers who have to take apart a bomb so it can't explode. Or think of those ginormous skyscrapers full of tall glass windows. Someone has to clean all those windows hundreds of feet up. 
or pilots who test super fast new aircraft to make sure they're safe. These men and women prepare themselves to do hard things over and over. God must give them like an extra dose of courage for breakfast every day. Can I get a sausage egg biscuit and a mocha latte with two pumps of courage, please? I don't think it works that way. We should ask someone. We're about to. Our guest today has faced some of the scariest situations you can imagine. Brain surgery, algebra three, calculus. How about a burning building? Wait, we get to talk to a real firefighter? Absolutely. Yes. His name is Trey and he spent 10 years working as a firefighter. And I'm gonna zip it so we can get to the real deal. Hey everyone. Hi Trey, we're so excited to talk with you. Yeah, I'm like trying not to fanboy right now. Same. So, did you always want to be a firefighter? Actually, no. Um, I had just finished school and a family friend had invited me to come check it out. So I thought, well, while I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, I might as well give it a shot. So this is actually me right here. So you thought you would just do this for a little while. Yeah, I thought I'd do it until I figured out what I really wanted to do in life. And then I really loved it. I loved that it gave me purpose and I learned that I could do hard things. What was your job like? Well, basically you train to respond to a lot of different emergencies. I mean, obviously there were fires, but we responded to medical calls. We responded to cats inside trees, really a lot of different things that we would have to respond to in any given time. Were you scared the first time you got called to a fire? Yeah. Anybody who would tell you they're not is probably lying to you, but we don't do anything in the fire department without learning how to control your emotions first. Wait, so you train to be brave? Yeah. I mean, you could say that. I mean, we did lots of physical training to make sure we stayed strong, but we also did lots of drills. I mean, drills on top of drills on top of drills to make sure that we were ready for anything we might face. Okay, so you get a call, what happens? Well, you really only get a little bit of information to start. So what do you do? So you jump on the truck and you start on your way and you're constantly getting more information as you go. And then when you get on scene, you're constantly getting more information and you're seeing what's happening in front of you. You really have to learn how to be flexible because things are constantly changing. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't know this. Fire doubles in size every 30 seconds. Wait, say that again? Fire doubles in size every 30 seconds. <laughs> That's wild. So you're there now, what do you do? Well, you're really just constantly assessing. I mean, you're taking in information as it's changing. Remember, you gotta stay flexible. So you're looking for hydrants. You're wondering if this is gonna be protecting just the structure or if this is gonna be a rescue situation where we might have to rush in and go take care of somebody whose life might be in danger. You really do have to stay on your toes constantly. What are some things that help you get ready for all that? Well, one tool is learning how to calm yourself down. Like, <laughs> you can just do that? Absolutely. Uh, I learned how to keep myself calm by controlling my breathing so that you can keep yourself focused and keep your mind clear. Even in a burning building? Especially inside a burning building. What's the scariest situation you faced on the job? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I had lots of scary moments, but I think one that comes to mind is uh, my crew and I arrived on the scene to a smaller house that had a lot of heavy fire and smoke showing from the right side of the house. And so in order to put out a fire, you have to get to the seat of the fire, which is where the fire originated. And when we went inside, we went up the stairs, there was one crew ahead of us, and we had a really hard time getting to the seat of the fire because it continued to be hotter and hotter and hotter. I mean, it was one of the hottest fires I've ever been in in my life. But one of the things you wanna avoid in a fire situation is if you take too long, because remember, fire doubles in size every 30 seconds. If you take too long, everything can ignite in the room at one time, and that's called a flashover. And that's not a situation that you or I or anybody would ever wanna be in. So I remember in that moment, the longer it was taking us to get to the seat of the fire, and as it's getting hotter and hotter, I started looking around for an exit. It's one of the things that they teach you is always have a way out. And so because how scared I was, I, I could turn over the corner and see the light coming through the front windows. I mean, there's heavy smoke. It's not like it's in the movies. You really can't see anything in front of your face. You just have to look for light. And I knew if I needed to, if we had a flashover situation, I could dive out the window to safety and always have a way to get out. Wow, Trey, that is incredible. Thank you, Trey. It's been amazing. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Wow. Trey had to dive into some pretty scary situations. Speaking of scary things, Wait until you hear the story before the story. Today, we're in book 17 of the Old Testament, Esther. God made a plan to bless the whole world through Abraham's family, the Israelites. 
But over and over, God's people would run to God and then pull away, back and forth, just like a yo-yo. At last, God allowed the Israelites to be captured by foreign nations so they would understand they can only be happy close to God. Even in captivity though, some of these men and women still loved and honored God, like a girl named Esther and her cousin Mordecai, which is where our epic story begins. Take it away. Years before, the Jewish people had been captured and taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. But then Babylon was conquered and became part of the Persian Empire with Susa as its capital. So Esther grew up in a land that was not her own. And when her parents died, her cousin Mordecai raised her as his own daughter. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Love him with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. One day, a new king named Xerxes came to power in Persia. And this guy was a character. He threw a crazy wild party and then fired his own queen for refusing to show up. Not the kind of guy you want running your country. Anyhow, when he finally calmed down, he realized he didn't have a queen anymore. So he decided to look for a new one. After a long search through the entire kingdom, Xerxes chose Esther. Cousin Mordecai, what do I do? Don't tell anyone you're from a Jewish family. We've already seen that Xerxes didn't bother to think much before making decisions, so he chose on a whim to promote an official named Haman to take charge of all the other nobles in the kingdom. Haman had a ginormous ego, and he loved making all the other officials outside the palace bow low to him. But Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman, and this made Haman so mad, he about went through the roof! Haman was such a terrible guy that he decided not only to punish Mordecai, but every single Jew in the country. He went to King Xerxes with a terrible plan. <laughs> Your Majesty, these Jews live differently than everyone else. They don't obey your laws. Who do they think they are? I know, right? <laughs> Give the order to destroy them. Hmm. Consider it done. I can't even. Xerxes actually sent a letter all over the kingdom declaring that on the 13th day of the 12th month, all Jews were to be killed. When Mordecai and the other Jews discovered this horrible news, they dressed in rough cloth and wept bitterly. Mordecai sent a message to Esther in the palace, telling her what Haman had done. You must ask the king to save our people. Esther was devastated. She sent a response to her cousin. Tell him, no one can come before the king unless he sends for them. If I do it, I'll die, unless he reaches out his gold scepter to me. Mordecai sent his answer right back. You may not escape, even though you are queen. Who knows? It's possible you became queen for a time just like this. Esther knew Mordecai was right. She sent him one more message. Tell Mordecai, gather all the Jews. Don't eat anything for three days. I and my servants will fast too. Then I'll go to the king. Esther faced a terrible dilemma, but she took three days to prepare her heart and her mind. Then she went to face the king. It must have taken every ounce of courage Esther had to step through those doors. And then she had to wait what felt like an eternity for the king to even notice her. At last, he looked up, then he smiled and reached out his golden scepter. What is it, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. <sighs> Esther must have been shaking with relief, but instead of making her request right away, she asked the king to attend a special banquet along with Haman. The king was flattered and curious. At the banquet, he told her once more, I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. I'd like you and Haman to come to another feast tomorrow. Then I'll answer your question. What? The king was 
so intrigued, he agreed to come back again. The next night, he and Haman joined Esther at a second festive meal. What do you want me to do for you? I'll give you up to half my kingdom. Esther took a deep breath and put it all on the line. Your Majesty, let me live. Please spare my people. We have been sold to be destroyed. Who is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Haman is the one. Xerxes was so enraged that he had Haman killed. Then the king created a new order that would allow the Jews to be saved. We will celebrate this day with great joy. The end. Wow, King Xerxes was kind of a loose cannon. <laughs> exactly. There was no way to predict what he would do, but Esther leaned into God, and she took a big, courageous step, even though she had no idea what would happen. So, what's our part in the story? Well, there might be a mean kid at school, someone who's always shoving smaller kids around or making fun of people. Yeah, and everyone's afraid to stand up to them. You can ask God for courage to be the one to face the bully and tell them, stop it, that's not okay. It's also important to let a teacher know what's going on. That takes courage too. Exactly. Or maybe you're selling cookies for a fundraiser and you need to ask a neighbor you don't know to buy some. It might feel pretty scary to knock on their door, but you can ask God for courage for that too. It's true. God never asks us to face tough situations on our own. That's one of the reasons God gave us Jesus. When we believe that Jesus is God's son and choose to follow him, we have the power of God's Holy Spirit living in us. We can be ready for anything that happens. And that is super awesome to remember. So true. All right, I'll see you guys next time. Bye, Erica. So here's the thing. You can do what you should, even when you don't know what will happen. You think I can be a firefighter like Trey? Absolutely. Now, where do we keep the hoses? <laughs> Thanks for joining us in the Story Lab. See you next time. Turn on the water! Wait, what?
All right, guys, that's it. We've had four incredible weeks to be able to talk about courage and standing in the face of your fears with God at your side. Guys, we're so thankful and happy that you were with us this month. We can't wait for our Christmas theme next month, which will start next week. So make sure you're tuning in with us. Same time, same way here on Facebook Live, YouTube, and also on our website, newlifeoneana.com. Guys, we love you. More importantly, God loves you. And we hope you have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you.